It has started. Good evening, and you are welcome to this edition of another explicit interview powered by Newsband Television. Today, we are going to be discussing President Mohamedou Buhari hesitation in signing the electoral bill. Here, as our guest, we have Mr. Emeka Gouonye Esquire. He is the president of the Ecologue Group and the founder and CEO of Due Process Advocates International Foundation. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you here, sir. Thank you so much for honoring our invitation once again. Thank you. Now, before we go to the main topic, what do you think about the electoral bill? Well, uh, it is, the bill is, um, a delayed but important development in the development of the laws regulating elections in Nigeria. The purpose of such laws, as most people will agree, is to continue the process of improving and refashioning the democratic process, the process through which the citizens elect their leaders, which is a vital part of uh, democracy. There is no perfect electoral system, but over the years, countries have continued to improve on what they have. The new electoral bill in Nigeria is indeed a long-awaited improvement on our electoral processes. One of the features, to the best of my knowledge, was to allow for electronic processes, enhanced electronic processes in the voting system. So it is a welcome development. And it is important to note that um, it was supported by the majority of the members of the National Assembly across party lines. So it is an important thing. Whether it is perfect, whether that's the end of the road is an entirely different thing. And in fact, it doesn't have to be perfect. It is enough that it's an improvement on what existed. And to that extent, most Nigerians welcome it. I particularly welcome it. I support it. Uh, now we have had a lot of back and forth um, in, in making the amendments from the CSOs, from concerned citizens and relevant stakeholders. Do you think that the final bill sent to the president still requires some adjustments? Um, well, the, the process of passing a bill and presenting it as the legislative process of debating and passing a bill, voting for a bill, and presenting it to the president for his assent, which turns it into law, is a political process all over the world. The Constitution obviously gives all the relevant arms of government, the legislature and the executive, their respective roles in the process. So there is nothing like what we will call minimum amount of debate or maximum amount of debate in the legislative process for a bill to be voted for by the legislature. So what we know is that this particular bill has gone through its processes. It has been further debated by um, stakeholders, as you rightly pointed out. And why was it necessary to involve stakeholders? Because it was controversial. People had different views and different ideologies, which they all wanted to be reflected in the bill. So it was necessary to consult wide and far. And having the stakeholders have their say was essentially a process of the requisite consultation necessary. So the question is, why is it not yet signed by the president? We don't know. 
Of course, I can give my opinion as to what I think the president is weighing in his mind and why he's delaying it, even when his own party that forms the majority in the National Assembly had essentially voted for the bill. But that is probably further down this discussion. Yes, there are speculations in the media space. Like you rightly said, that the president returned the bill, citing the mandatory um, direct primaries for political parties. What are your thoughts? Is this enough reason for the president to return the bill? And remember that the majority of, um, of lawmakers that pushed for the direct primaries were from the APC. So what are your thoughts on this um, particular development? Um, well, I, I like to concentrate more on what we call the minimum standards of the process. The bill has been voted for. The president cannot participate in voting for a bill. The president is not part of the legislature. He, he cannot. He may recommend using his political processes and uh, his party influence, recommend or re request for modifications or revisions, but that's not really within his constitutional powers. The constitution is straightforward on what the president should do, which is assent or decline to assent. Delays or hesitation, as the title of this discussion pointed out, has no place in the constitution. There's nothing like delays. It's not, the president has no constitutional power to just delay. He must act within a particular, a reasonable time period. And his choices, his options are two. Assent to the bill or decline to assent to the bill. As to what goes on in the mind of the president or why he is against the bill that has been voted for by his own party at the National Assembly, it boggles my mind. I don't know exactly what the president is thinking about. I can say, well, that the president does not want the achievements or the expected achievements of the bill to take effect, which is the issue of direct primaries. Now, this discussion is not for me to explain the importance of direct primaries because opinions will differ widely. I see my role as relatively restricted to the question of whether the president could do what he is doing, whether the constitution mandates him to do so, whether he has acted rightly in accordance with the constitution, and whether he has followed due process in the context of political philosophy. What I mean political philosophy here is his party forms the majority in the National Assembly. If his party was against, if majority of his party members in the National Assembly were against this bill, the bill would not have been voted for. But for them to have voted for it, it means that we're actually looking at an internal conflict within the APC. That is, the president is disagreeing or holding a different position from the majority members of his party in the National Assembly. What why is that so? Well, guesses are bound. I don't want to hazard these guesses. Maybe the president doesn't want democracy. Maybe the president wanted a system of politics like the, in the past, where money controls things, where the parties somehow handpick and appoint officials that contest elections, as opposed to what direct primaries are intended to achieve. Direct primaries are actually transferring power to the voters, down to individuals, and thereby minimizing the influence of parties in the choice of candidates. So that is really the true intentment of the principles of democracy. So the bill and the essence of direct primary was to enhance democracy, to get power, the decision as to the choice of leaders, ultimately down to individuals, not just delegates. Not just now, delegates. Please, please go yes. ahead. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. So, so, so the essence of um, direct primaries is essentially to shift importance, power, and relevance to individual voters. Instead of allowing parties to deal with delegates, delegates are easily purchasable, as you know. You can actually 
count the number of delegates and share money among them and choose candidates as you please. And it becomes who pays the highest amount. But shifting it through direct primaries to individuals, to citizens, at their individual levels is ultimately what we want. That is what democracy would want. So we don't know why the president should be against that. I don't want to say that the president is anti-democracy. I don't want to say that the president is more favorable, favorably disposed to a process that enables the elect, uh, uh, delegates to be purchased or the process that enables money to hold such a sway in our political process. I don't want to accuse the president, but I think that his behavior is odd. And he hasn't been a, I don't think there has been sufficient discussion among Nigerians to probe why, why the president is acting in the manner he has acted. But the bottom line is, there is a bill the president is going to sign or decline to sign. And if he declines to sign it, the constitution is also clear on what follows next, which is essentially that the bill is going to be returned to the National Assembly, be voted all over, and if the majority votes for it, then they will override the presidential assent. In other words, the bill could become law without the necessity of the president's assent to it. That is, if it goes that full hog. And that may be why the president is talking about hesitation. He doesn't want to say decline. If he declines to sign it, then the legal consequences of the constitutional process is automatic. He moves to the next level. So, but if he hesitates as it is, then it could be said, well, he hasn't assented to the bill, but he also hasn't declined to assent. And that means that the president is playing with time. How long would that go? I don't know. But I think it's very unfortunate that the president of Nigeria is hesitating as it is to assent the bill passed by a national assembly in which his party has a clear majority. All right, remember that you can join this conversation simply by raising up your digital hand. I will take as much questions and comments as possible. Now, you um, you hinted on an internal conflict in the APC that may have led to the president um, um, hesitating to sign this bill. Do you think that this is con this can and will affect our democracy? This internal conflict in the major in the major um, the major political parties. Sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't get that question correct. Please, could you repeat? I said, do you think the internal conflict in the APC, which you hinted at in your current submission, can mm -hmm. affect our democracy in Nigeria if there's a disconnect between the president and his political party? Do you think it can affect our democracy? Uh, uh, yeah, well, certainly. Certainly, it, it, it could help in the following ways. One, it means that the party is not completely controlled by the president. It means that there are members of the APC who are willing to take a position contrary to that of the president, who is the head of the leader of the party. So certainly, to have a situation of such internal debates and disagreement enhances choice. Ultimately, it favors us. But my belief is that Whatever we, we see as the conflict today was more accidental than a deliberate evolution of the ruling party. I don't think that APC, looking at its members, looking at their various caucuses, I don't think that the APC has come to a point of dynamic disagreement within the party. I think that the president probably didn't work hard enough to get all his party members rallied to a particular position. And that may be what gives him confidence that he could just hesitate and ultimately achieve what he wants. But if there could be such a system of internal disputes, internal uh, contentions within the party, it ultimately helps us. It helps democracy because it further devolves power. It further creates camps and enhances debates. 
It means that issues are no longer dumped uh, automatically. It means that the party is no longer monolithic, that there are dynamic differences and exchanges within the party. That will help us, theoretically. But the question is, is that happening? Or is this just an accidental development? All right. Now, talking about the electoral bill, if it is signed into law, how do you think it's going to affect our 2023 um, elections? Uh, in many ways. But let me talk about, again, these uh, direct primaries. If you noticed in the Nigerian electoral processes in the past, the parties hold tremendous, the party leadership holds tremendous influence over the choice of candidates because they use delegates. And these delegates means in the primaries, for instance, that um, they basically choose who will contest. And once chosen, if the party is in power and has sufficient influence, then it becomes a fait accompli. The people's rule is narrowed down to basically choosing one of the people the party is selected. So the people are forced into what we call comparative analysis of evil. For instance, three wrong men are presented for you to vote for one of them. And the voters have no choice but to choose one of the three wrong men. In the end, they are going to end up with the wrong man anyway. But if you shift away this controlling influence of delegates and push the power to the primaries, then people can take their contention to the voters. What we want in Nigeria today is for a man, who wants, a person who wants to run, to go to the people, present himself, and the people will determine right from the beginning who will make it up there and be on the ballot. But as it is today, the parties choose their delegates fewer than the number of voters. And the delegates, because they are few in number, are easily purchasable. And people going to these um, primaries, carrying uh, money in, in bags and sharing it among those delegates in the night before the voting is done, and they choose whoever they want. It becomes a question of who pays them more. A very corrupt process indeed. Moving it down to the people, facing the voters at the very basic level, right from the beginning, is ultimately in the interest of democracy. It is something we want to do so that Nigerian people can finally have the power to choose who goes out there to represent them, to choose who makes it to the ballot papers. And in the process, they will improve the essence of political competition, which is democracy. That's what I think this bill is, and that is why I, I, I'm, I'm shocked that the president of Nigeria is not giving it its full backing or showing sufficient enthusiasm to enable the process to take effect. Do you think that the president might be hesitating because of how it's going to influence the 2023 elections. Do you think the 2023 elections have anything to do at all with the president's um, resistance to sign, signing the bill? Yes, I want to say so. I want to think so. But the problem with that thought is, why would the president be the only APC politician thinking in that direction? Why wouldn't the APC members of the National Assembly reason along that line? That is why I'm hesitating to say so. Obviously, it will appear that the president is trying to control the outcome. He's trying to control the outcome in the forthcoming, in the, in the next elections. He's trying to maintain the structures and control system that is already in place and which he had mastered, which he had relied upon twice to win election. So he wants to continue that. That's what I want to think. But the only reason I don't want to just jump at that is the answer is because how come that other APC party members, their leaders in National Assembly, are willing to disagree with the president on the bill. Why are they not interested also in maintaining the existing structures that brought them into power? Why are they willing? Because I will say this. I could have said that the APC is afraid of losing the next election. 
at least in key areas. But why would that be the exclusive concern of the president? That should be a collective concern of the APC leadership across the board. So if that was the case, we expected the battle line to have been between PDP and lawmakers and APC lawmakers. We didn't expect the battle line to be between the lawmakers and the president, and the majority of the lawmakers are president's party men. So that is why I don't just want to take an easy and simplistic explanation that the president is trying to manipulate the outcome or influence in a dangerous way the outcome of the next election. That is the collective concern of all APC people, their governors, their national assemblymen. They all want APC to win and remain the ruling party. That is what they want. The Senate president will no longer be Senate president if APC loses. The Speaker of the House of Rep will not be Speaker of the House of the Rep if APC loses. The governors will not, APC governors will not remain APC governors if APC loses. So, so why is it, therefore, that it should be only the president that is pursuing this desperate effort to maintain the leadership or ascendancy of APC in the next election. So because of that, I'm hesitant. I think there's a combination of factors. The president is not well advised. He's not well advised because personally, the president has completed his second term. He's not coming back. If there's anything President Buhari should be concerned about at this moment, is it is his legacy. The president should be concerned about how he will be remembered in history. The president is going to be over 80 years old by the time he completes his second term. And given the human nature, human uh, what life, life issue, what we know about human life, after 80 years, a person doesn't have much of a, a long time to live an active life. So what else would the president want after age 80, if not his legacy? if not how, the, how history will remember him. And why is it that the president is taking this position, which is highly, highly unpopular and actually very dangerous? Why is he trying to hold his country back from making this important next move? So I'm, 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 I'm confused. I think the president is not properly advised. If I were his advice, I would tell him, forget the party, Mr. President. Forget who wins the next election. That's not relevant for you because you're going to be 80 when, 82 when you leave. And after 82, maybe you're going to die at 85 or 90. Who, who cares? Focus on how you'll be remembered 100 years from now. That is what I think the president is failing to do. That's unfortunate for him personally. Okay, remember that you can join this conversation simply by raising the show hand. I will try to take as much questions and comments as possible. Now we have a question in the comments box, and it said, is the president and all APC members not supposed to be subject to the manifesto of the party that brought them into power? I think this came from one of our participants here. Did you get the question? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, somebody's asking, are uh, all the APC members not to be subject to the manifesto? Of their party that yes. brought into power? Yes. Um, well, I, I would think so. I would think that the parties, there's what we call party discipline, party ideology. Majority of their members are supposed to do so. But in this case, it's not clear what the party manifesto is regarding the electoral bill. Because all the parties, would say somewhere in their manifestos that they support democracy, that they support the will of the people, that they respect the constitutional process. Whatever ideology you have is going to take the form of a different interpretation of the constitution, but never will it uh, amount to total repudiation of the constitution, which seems to be happening here. So why are they not? United, I think that question should have been, or maybe intended to me, why are the APC people not united? They certainly may have different opinion as to what is in their best interest. They can put their best interest differently. But I cannot find anywhere in any manifesto, it's highly unlikely.
parties tend to be bound by their core ideology. Okay, so now this um the the stance of the president and the body language of the president should it come as a surprise to you, considering that the president has consistently um taken a in quotes a strong stance in in his public policy, strong stance approach in his public policy. Is this his hesitation as it's coming as a surprise to you? Are you surprised by his uh, action in not assenting to the bill immediately? No, I'm not surprised at all. Uh, our president, with due respect to him, has shown a high degree of policy inconsistency. That is, it is difficult to pin the president down in terms of what his policy uh, trajectories are. He acts in ways that are odd, the ways that even undermine his party, and the ways that undermine his own legacy. He managed, for instance, this president managed to earn a bad reputation in many areas. He's somehow, I feel, that this president is a good man as an individual. Personally, I really feel Buhari is a good man, but a very bad leader. And what makes him bad leader? Because he's surrounded by people he has little control or desire to control. People he has little control over, or maybe has no desire to control them. And those people are the people that run the government. Those are the people that gave the president this extraordinarily bad reputation. He's, he's, he's hated in so many ways. Go to the social media, the way that people talk about the president. I feel sorry for him. I myself have received a lot of swipe because I supported this president. I supported him. When he was running, I felt that his history was extremely unique. He showed extraordinary resilience, lost the election three times, and then won. It was incredible, you know. Then I felt the way he was kicked out of office when he was the military head of state by his colleagues was unfair. I felt that his detention during that time after he was kicked out of office was going to enrich his views about life, about leadership, about the world. I thought this was the kind of man we could trust to lead this, lead this country in the right direction. I thought his military discipline as a general in the army and his reputation for anti-corruption was something that was very important for the country. So I stood for Buhari. In 2014, I made a lot of enemies. I didn't know him. I met him once, but we didn't connect to anything. So I didn't know him. I wasn't expecting anything from his government in any way. But looking at all things, I felt that Nigeria needed a strong man. I felt he was a strong man. I felt he would fight Boko Haram and defeat Boko Haram. I felt that the security situation in Nigeria was better entrusted to him. I believe that the war against corruption was better entrusted to him. I believe that Nigeria needed a renewal of a sense of discipline. And I thought this was the man. Then I thought that Nigeria needed someone who could steer Nigeria in the right direction when it comes to, to, to due process of the law, administration of criminal justice. I thought so because he was a victim. I know as a fact, I tell Nigerians this, they don't understand it. Buhari actually won that election that was given to Yaradua. I know that. Top government officials in Yaradua's administration told me that that Buhari won that election. So I thought that for a man that had gone through this, he was going to come with reform in front of him. That reform was going to be his first move. But unfortunately, President Buhari disappointed me. I can name instances. For instance, when he took six months to appoint his ministers, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that any president in modern time, especially someone we thought was a transformational leader, would take six months to appoint ministers and ended up appointing the worst people as ministers. That was when I began to doubt 
my initial assessment of Buhari as a leader. As I said, individually, he's a, a wonderful man. I can tell you that. I have seen his behaviors. But you see, in leadership, when you lead a country, it's not a question of how nice you are as an individual. It is about your ability to lead, decisive measures that will turn things around, that will show boldness. The president hasn't done that. So if you ask me, am I surprised about his current hesitation or indecisiveness? I'm not. I'm seeing Buhari being Buhari, being unable to understand what is good for him and for the country. Delaying these things, modeling up things, and probably ending up with another failure, as we have seen, of course. All those things I expected of him did not happen. We did not stop Boko Haram, state of insecurity worsened in the country. We did not stop corruption. It got worse, and things continued the way they were going. We did not uh, maintain discipline. Nigeria, things are worse. So after the blunders of Jonathan, yes, in my opinion, Jonathan was a big blunder. After the blunders of Jonathan, I was expecting a transformational leader to come up there and clean up the origin stable. I thought Buhari was the man. No, Buhari wasn't the man. So what he's doing today is typical, typical Buhari, uh, uh, you know, as I know him. Hello, can you hear me, sir? I can hear you again now. All right, sorry. Um, let me call Mr. Enumba. I can see that his hand is up, Mr. Enumba. Um, yes, with this present confusion trailing the signing of the electoral bill, um, if President Buhari eventually signs this electoral bill, is he giving the pressure that he has done so under duress, or is it that he is taking his time to make sure that the bill fully conforms to his idea of what our electoral bill should be like, electoral laws should be like? Do you have what is your opinion in that regard? It could be either, indeed, it could be both. It's all a function of uh, the spin the political people place on it. If the president can come and explain why the hesitation, cites maybe point out a few changes that occurred or a few things he did during the period of hesitation, people may buy that argument that there was a justification for hesitation. Otherwise, people are going to say his hands were forced. But what I wonder, and I, I hope others are thinking in this direction is this, the Nigerian president, given the Nigerian political system, retains tremendous influence to control his party members in the National Assembly. If the president picks up the phone now and begins to call them one by one, and say, this is what I want you to do, or call the party leadership in the National Assembly and say, hey, this is what we want. You guys go and do it then the president can decline this bill and the National Assembly will not override his asset. So I don't really agree that Nigeria has gotten to a point where the National Assembly can override the president. No, I don't think so. So what is going on, and that's why I think that this is typical Buhari, making a big deal out of little, failure to communicates in very clear terms, leaving people wondering what intent. If he wants to frustrate this bill, he has the capacity to do so by controlling, just calling his National Assembly members and telling them, hey, vote the other way around next time. He can do that. The presidency of Nigeria is a very highly concentrated power. It, it, we call Nigeria a democracy, but it's not yet there. It is still tremendous dictatorship at play. We see it all the time. 
The National APC members, nobody in the National Assembly, no APC politician in the National Assembly can oppose the president of Nigeria from his party. It won't happen. And if he tries it, they have many ways to make sure he will not return to power. So, so, it, so it, whether we call it, um, if you have sense, whether we say he does so under uh, pressure or that he was taking his time to make sure everything is all right, that is going to be a matter of spinning, a matter of interpretation, a matter of the explanation he gives. If he has good guys come out there and explains it away, many people will believe it. Many people will believe it, certainly. Otherwise, many people close and say he was forced. In my opinion, I don't think the president is forced. He can frustrate that bill if he wants to, in Nigeria. Mr. Lamba, your hand is still up. Can you hear me? The my yes. other question would be um, now that Nigerians are kind of you know getting agitated, we have had several press statements. Samba urged him to sign the bill. Some civil society organizations are telling the National Assembly, if by December 18, which was the deadline, he hasn't signed the bill, override it. Well, I don't think, I don't know whether you touched on this point. I think by December 18, if he hasn't signed it, does it become law automatically? Or will the National Assembly um, need to override it again? What, do you, what is the position of the law? I, I think the law requires them to override it. I don't, I think so, but I may not be too sure that, uh, Daniel. I know what it is in the United States, but I haven't actually paid very close attention to the position of 1999 Nigerian constitution on it. But I believe that the National Assembly will have to take a measure. It will not occur automatically. There will have to be uh, a measure by the National Assembly. Well, um, does it sound reasonable? Overriding will occur where he refused to sign the bill. And OK, well, I, let me not speculate. I don't know. I don't know the, what, what the situation will be. If he refuses to sign, whether they will override him or if he does, if he hasn't taken any action, whether the law becomes law automatically, maybe we'll have to find out. Uh, well, but the possibility of the law taking effect because of inaction is very highly mm -hmm. unlikely. You know why? Why? If his purpose of delay, if the purpose of inaction is to frustrate the law, he should know that he wouldn't succeed, that he would better decline it and get more time. So why would he, why would anybody allow things to occur by default against him? If the president's desire is for the bill to become law, he will assent to it immediately. If his desire is for the bill not to become the law, he will not allow it to become the law automatically by default. He will do something that will show declination. Because the declination will now require the National Assembly to take further step. And it is in that further step that you can expect intense internal politicking within APC to make sure that the further step is not taken. So I don't really think that any president will achieve his goal by just doing nothing. That's my thought, even though we are still speculating on the precise position of the Nigerian constitution on what happens next. But I don't think that the president will just do nothing, knowing that doing nothing will ultimately uh, uh, effectuate the bill into law. I don't think that's how he wants to do it. Um, Mr. Lumba, your hand is still. Okay. Remember that you can join this conversation simply by raising the digital hand and we'll try to take as much questions and comments as possible. Now, um, we have spoken so much about the bill and how it's going to affect our democracy and also how it's going to affect the 2023 elections. But if indeed the bill returns to the National Assembly after the deadline of December 18th, 
What other process is it going to follow? Will it be rejected or will the lawmakers have to make adjustments and send it back to the president? Um, do you have any opinion on this? Uh, well, all these are possible. You know, it depends on the dynamics of the communication between the presidency and the National Assembly. The presidency could take a position and say, hey, gentlemen, let us not. I don't want a situation where this bill is completely rejected and the mud is thrown on the face of APC. Let us do something. Let us think it here and there. If he persuades his party members, it will lead to an amendment of the bill and further presentment for the presidential asset. So, on the other hand, if the president returns it and says, I hereby reject it, and nothing, I mean, I hereby decline to assign, to assent, and nothing further is done, then we may have the position of saying, well, would the National Assembly allow this to collapse altogether or would they just move ahead? In my assessment, the president is going to give a very extensive, if he refuses to assent to it, if he returns it to them on assented to, He's going to come up with a very long reasons and excuses why he did not do so. And that's going to create an imperative on the part of his party members to consider his reasons. And any serious effort to reconsider or consider his reasons will lead inevitably to some tinkering of the bill. So we are not yet close to the end of this game. The president has the key. He can end it any moment by assenting to it. If he declines to assent to it, or continues to hesitate as it is, I believe it will trigger further political processes within the National Assembly. National Assembly is not going to come out there, call a press conference, and say, we hereby decide to override President Buhari. No, it will lead to all manner of attacks. They're going to see Buhari's leadership as a failure. That the PDP people will jump on it. So APC wouldn't want to give the uh, PDP that advantage. So, so what I expect, you know, on the scheme of, in the scheme of things is that the, there will be further politicking going on, unless the president makes a dramatic uh, change of mind and signs this bill and gets it done. Otherwise, expect for that moment. Mm -hmm. Talking about yeah. um, the politics behind the scene and the politicking, is it possible for the lawmakers to form a group and go lobby the president to sign this bill? Because like you rightly said, the APC mix of the majority of the lawmakers, is it possible to pressure him to sign this bill? It is possible, but I don't see the incentive. It is certainly possible. If we can find a thing where the members of the National Assembly, Assembly in their right numbers would come out and take a position and feel the need to persuade the president, yes, they will do so. They have access to the president, easy access to the president. But the question is, if you look at the interest of politicians, the interest of individual lawmakers is much narrower than the interest of the president. The president is the president of the country. The lawmakers are looking at most their constituencies or the state, in case it's a, a, a politician that wants to run for, for this as a governor or something. But otherwise, will that happen? Will it be necessary? Can we come to a situation where the head of the Senate, the president of the Senate, would lead some law senators? And they go to the president and say, sir, we really think you should sign this bill. But it, it, that could happen. But why hasn't it happened? So whether such persuasion would be influential enough to cause the president to shift ground, I don't know. I am actually thinking that a more influential pressure point will be from these groups that are criticizing the presidency for the delay, the media, the public opinion. The, those things are really very influential because they put pressure, not just on the president, but on the party, the ruling party. 
people are expressing their discontent. They are saying they are not satisfied with the state of things. And they are pointing as the leadership, as the cause of their, their concern. That should be a problem for APC. And APC, I may think, will come and say, hey, we are giving PDP a whole lot of advantage in the next election. We don't want to go down as the party that opposed the bill. So let the president understand that his position is imperiling the, the, the party. Then they can go there. In that case, it doesn't have to be only members of National Assembly. It could also include the executive of the party, the party administration, you know, what to call uh, the chairman of the APC, the second. They could all come the down and say, committee. Mr. President. Yes, the working committee. They could come down and say, Mr. President, our party is being imperiled by your uh, indecisiveness. Let us act, let us claim this as our achievement. Let's go down in history as the party that reformed the electoral process. Why are you sitting there, Mr. President, and allowing our opponents to take credit? The president may say, ah, is that true? All right, let's do it. So that could happen, really. All right. You know? Now, just before I call um, Mr. Henning, but I said this before, and I'm trying to say it again. The president has continuously shown that he is trying to maintain the strong leader um, perspective. So he's trying to, or he tries to not be influenced by public opinion and um, pressure groups. Do you think that media and the concerned citizens pressuring him will actually have an effect more than his political party influencing him or lobbying him rather? Oh, no, no, I, it's not really a question of comparative effect. It's a question of what is already happening. I believe that his party members are already talking with him. And I believe that the interests of the party, individual party officials in the National Assembly, or I mean uh, politicians in the National Assembly, will not be strong enough to try to sway the president. Come on. If you're a senator today, APC senator today, the primary goal is to be in the good book of the president, not to do anything else. That is the state of Nigerian politics. If you are a senator, and an issue comes up, you want to be in the good book of the president. So I don't really think that they, even if they have the power, as you rightly pointed out, I don't think they have the incentive to risk their political capital trying to take a position that the president may decline. Yeah, you're a senator. You've got a limited amount of political capital and goodwill with the presidency. Are you going to risk it on this issue? Because if you persuade the president and the president says, no, I'm sorry, I can't do what you requested, that, that is not going to leave a pleasant feeling in you. That means you are not with the president on that particular issue. So would the politicians do it? I think very unlikely. They have inhibitions, they have limitations that will stop them from taking that course of action. On the other hand, the civil society don't have inhibitions. They don't have limits. They will hit as hard as they could possibly punch. So in that case, the president must also know that the opinion of the people may matter. Yes, he tries to be a tough man, but there's a limit to it. There's a limit to it. All this right. president has never come out openly to say to Nigerians, I don't care what you think. No. That means that somehow, he cares. He doesn't want to say he doesn't care. Hmm. All right. Um, I can see one of our regulars here, Dr. Uankwo Oizigwe. He's here and his hand is up. Doctor, I've asked you to unmute, kindly unmute. Hmm. Thank you, Barrett um, Emeka. So there are issues. Uh, that one has, you know, one has to look at before looking at the, the trajectory of your analysis. First of all, what are the bones of contention in that electoral bill that uh, seems to militate the conflict situation? Two, what are the interests groups 
who are the and who and what are the conflicting interest groups at log ahead with even within the APC themselves. Three, among these conflicting groups, which one do you think the president has some soft spots that tries to, you know, to dampen his urge towards uh, affecting uh, the legal processes on the bill? So I have my three questions. Uh, doctor, thank you very much for your question. Uh, regarding the first issue of um, the what are the contentious issues, there are several of them. Certainly. But look at the approach I have taken. I am dealing with a situation where the National Assembly had voted for bill. And that National Assembly has the majority of APC politicians. The same party as the president. I understand the political process to mean that even as they were debating that bill, the president's men were lobbying their party members in the National Assembly to influence their voting decisions. And that failed. So regardless of all the splinters of conflict or factions that may exist there, and there are quite a number of them, you're right. But the critical issue is that at this point, there's a clear division. I'm looking at two parties at this moment in a way that makes a whole lot of sense, lot of sense for my analysis, which is the National Assembly APC men and the presidency APC men. So now I wondered, how come? Because if you look at all these older factions, let us say that one faction is persuading the National Assembly in one direction, and the other faction is persuading in the opposite direction, and that the, the faction that persuaded the National Assembly is not the faction that the president supported. That clearly would have happened. But at this point, what I'm looking at is, how did that internal dynamic between the presidency and the National Assembly, because if you're a president, almost everywhere in the world, your men will be interested in keeping your party members online. You want them aligned with the view of the presidency. You don't want to have divisions between the presidency and his majority party members in the National Assembly. The kind of conflict we are having now, doctor, is what we may have in a place where the party that controls the presidency is not the party that controls the National Assembly. But when they're of the same party, then you must recognize that a situation such as we have at hand amounts to an internal conflict in the party, and it is major. It is major because it is between the presidency and the National Assembly. And these two factions, the presidency and the National Assembly, overshadow all other smaller factions. So there are many people, of course. The president is talking to some people. There are some powerful interests, including individuals and groups who would have come to the president and said, no, we don't like this bill. This bill is not in your interest. It's not in this person's interest. Don't sign it. It's not for us to begin to list those endless um, line of people who are talking to the president. No, what matters is for us to recognize that the president, regardless of why he's taking the position he has taken, has decided to stand against the National Assembly position. And the National Assembly is controlled by his party. So there is an internal logjam in APC. How do they resolve it? I don't know. But, and that is actually what the discussion is about. What would the president do? And what would the National Assembly do? I think that the president has leverage and opportunities to further delay this process, if that is his wish. But I also highlighted 
that it is difficult to tell exactly what the wish of Buhari is. Because of Buhari's tendency towards policy inconsistency, lack of communication, and lack of clarity when he communicates. So it is a hydra-headed problem. I don't want to go into those uh, factions, because if I go, they will not finish tonight. There are probably 200 factions with different opinions on the bill. But all those things have been funneled into the position of the National Assembly and the position of the presidency. They are now there for representing the two conflicting positions on the bill. Those who want the bill enacted, enacted into law and those who want the bill not enacted into law. The presidency being in the group against the bill, the National Assembly APC being in group of those in favor of the bill. How deep is this conflict? I don't know. But I believe that the president could take a phone now and speak to the members of the National Assembly. He only needs to get 30 of them. He doesn't need to talk to others. He will speak to 30 senators and say, hey, I want you guys to be against this bill. It's, that's not what I want. It wouldn't involve a lot of persuasion because you see, unlike in the United States, where a senator is worried that the president is asking him to do something that could cost him his election. Nigerian senator doesn't think that way. The people don't matter much. The presidency matters. They determine a whole lot of things including the fact that the presidency could have the EFCC arrest you close to the next uh, election time. You could be going through EFCC detention at that time. So all kind of nonsense exists in Nigeria. The president has tremendous power. Let us not just think that these uh, senators are going to override him or the governor. No, 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 no. EFCC could write you a letter and invite you for questioning. And that's the end of you politically. Every Nigerian politician knows that. I don't think APC members would oppose the presidency in a manner that would impose their bill on him if he seriously opposes it. All right, okay, so now just before I like to... Okay, okay, doctor, please go ahead. Uh, uh, let me just... Uh, I think, in my own opinion, the president is not in the power game. He just... Uh, he just a neutral umpire trying to look at how to settle the matter. There are two issues. First was the electronic transmission of results, which the National Assembly refused, and later they accepted and included it. And then the issue of, of primaries, primaries for nomination, which is a frontal attack against the governors. The senators decided to include that primary for nomination as a counter to the overbearing influence of the governors in deciding who will even go to any election. So the matter is not a party matter. It is a survival of the fittest between the senators who feel that without that bill, they will always be at the mercy of the governors to decide their political future. And the governors who also feel that if that bill goes, their influence as governor, chief executives of the states with powers to decide who will go this, who, you know, who will go to Senate or House of Rep will now be taken away from them. These are the major issues. So it's a contest. And the president appears to be in a state of dilemma. If he signs it, he will be against the governors. If he doesn't sign it, he will also be against the members of uh, the National uh, Assembly. So it's not even a party matter. The president has nothing at stake, at stake because he's actually not not going for a third term. It's for these people who still want to maintain their political interest, their political influence on the electorate, that the matter is. So I think the president is only sending it back for them to have an internal you know, resolution between the two wearing groups over this issue of primaries. 
direct primaries. That is the bone of contention. It's survival of the fittest. That is my own opinion. Yes. Doctor, very, very good analysis you just made. But I have a question, uh, yes. which goes back to what we are saying. Yes. It is still a PC conflict. It's still a party faction. Whether it is APC government against APC legislators, mm. it's still a party thing. The question that bubbles the mind is, why would the president defer to the governors? Why wouldn't the president have some value standard independent of the factions? Since he is not going for a term and all this, why can't the president say, all right, regardless of who is fighting who, what is right by Nigerians, what is right by my legacy? Governors are kicking against it, suggests that the president is beholden to the governors. On the contrary, a president in his second term is not beholden to the governors. And even if he was beholden to the governors, he will act fast, fast to, enact, to sign this law in order to remove the influence of the governors. So why would the president, why would President Buhari care so much about the position of the governors if he knows that their position is wrong? Why? Is he afraid of the governors? Even if he was in his first term, and needing the support of the governors. This law is actually intended to clip, as you rightly pointed out, the law has the effect of clipping the wings of governors and shrinking their range of influence. That should have been in the interest of somebody who is scared of the governors as the National Assembly is. Because obviously, from your analysis, taking it as valid, it means the National Assembly perceive the governors as against their interests and they want to clip their wings. That should be the concern of all APC politicians except the governors. So there's no basis. It hasn't explained why the president would defer to the governors in this conflict. All right, thank you so much, sir. Um, um, we are almost out of time. So let me just ask you this before we round off. Now, in your earlier submission, you mentioned that if the president fails to meet up with the deadline in a sense not declining, the bill can go back to the, um, to the legislative house. And if it is voted with a third majority, it can pass into law without um, the president accept. Can you just expatiate on that and then we would round up? Uh, yes, generally speaking, the lawmaking process requires that when the lawmakers have passed a bill, the executive arm of government headed by the president yeah. will assent yeah. to it yeah. in order for such bill to become law. And when it becomes law- do, I said, wait. Okay. Please go ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. All right. So it is designed that way. But also, the framers of the Constitution or the philosophers that developed this political philosophy realized that there could be a stalemate, a situation where a law made by the president and by the uh, passed by, uh, voted by the National Assembly could stall at the presidency. In other words, the president may not want to assent to such law. So the uh, idea came up that what happens if the president and the legislature do not agree on law? Since we believe that the legislature makes the law, we think or we came to the idea that the National Assembly must be able to pass the law over the objection of the presidency. So instead of giving the presidency the power to totally veto a law, the Constitution gave him a power only to delay its passage. And 
that power of delay means that the law must wait for a period of time to determine whether the president has, is going to sign it or not. But if after that time he failed to sign it, then the National Assembly can just go ahead without the, pres the, the, the consent of the president. So regardless, each country will have its own variation in detail, such as how many days the presidents will hold the law, what will happen. But the general idea is that when it comes to lawmaking, National Assembly has the ultimate final say. The president should have sent the law, but when he fails to have sent the law, the National Assembly could override it. So what will happen, I expect, is if the president doesn't sign this law within a particular time uh, allowed for him to delay, the law will return to the national, the bill will return to the National Assembly. National Assembly will be required to do something. That thing could mean representing the bill for fresh votes, giving the lawmakers an opportunity to vote this bill into law without the assent of the president. Sometimes the lawmakers will change their mind. A few of them may say, well, we don't want to go ahead with this law if the president doesn't have it, have a support, uh, doesn't support it. Also, they may say, no, let's go ahead and have this law, regardless of the opposition of the president. So if that happens here, if the National Assembly has determined and has vested in their interest, as do the doctor rightly pointed out, if they are, then they may very well say, we will get our law in, regardless of what the president does. They may see the president to be standing with the governor, which means standing against their interest. And that may mean that they could override presidential assets. It's possible. I don't, I don't want to speculate what will happen exactly. I'm just going to tell you what is possible. All these things are possible. They can override presidential assets and have that bill passed into law regardless. I think we're having a network problem. I can't hear yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, Augusta, your network is uh, having problems. I apologize for my interruption earlier. It's an, it's let me right. quickly, okay, let me quickly chip in here. Um, uh, Mr. Ugwenya is quite right to a large extent. While we were talking, I, I quickly checked the provisions of the Nigerian 1999 Constitution, Part 1, Chapter 5, Section 58, Subsection 4. Where a bill is presented to the president for assent, he shall, within 30 days thereof, signify that he assents or that he withholds his assent. Subsection 5. Where the, pre where the president withholds his assent and the bill is again passed by each house by two thirds majority, the bill shall become law and the assent of the president shall not be required. Beautiful. There is a super majority to override the presidential assent. I, I, I appreciate that. That's, that. Thank you for that clarification, Daniel. That seems to be consistent with most democracies. So the bill that overrides the presidential assent is uh, voted in by super majority. So I don't know exactly the, the distribution of the votes for the bill. This time, I don't know how many senators voted for it, how many members of the House voted for it. But to override the president, you will have a two-third majority. But it will have to be represented for voting, and it will be voted. It cannot happen automatically. That's correct. That's correct. Augusta, are you there? Yeah. We're having network problem, I think. I I can see. Well, I think that is the that brings us to the end of the conversation. Thanks you very much, um, Chief Mwenye, for being with. I I always forget that you have taken the Chief title. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Daniel. Yeah, thank you. It, it's a pleasure to have you around. Thank you for the clar clarification you brought to some of the issues tonight. Thank you so much. And to the rest of our, and to the rest of the audience, thank you all for joining, and we look forward to having you again next time. Thank you and good evening. Yes, can you hear me now? Can you hear me?